For the final part of our lecture today, we will be discussing the calculation of SNM, and this is heavily based on Civic and Lowe-Stroh's work from 1987. So, what about simulating SNM? How can we calculate the SNM with SPICE? And there are some options here. So, we can insert DC sources, a Q and Q bar, um, where, as I showed you before in that little picture there. But where exactly do we connect them? Um, we have our, uh, you know, our cross-coupled inverters over here, right? And how do we stick a DC source here? We don't stick it at a certain node. We have to stick it in between two nodes. And exactly what do we measure? I mean, how do we know that the, the bit has flipped when we get to the right VN? That's a big question, and I'm not sure that there's a correct answer for it. We can also draw butterfly curves. So that's an option. We can go and we can, you know, draw out our butterfly curves and start measuring, you know, uh, and finding these things. But how are we going to do that within SPICE? How are we going to find the largest squares? And when we talk about Monte Carlo simulations, you know, we want to run variation. We have to have a real easy way of calculation because we're going to be running this thing, you know, thousands and maybe hundreds of thousands or even millions or, or more times. So how are we going to do that? Well, let's define the graphical solution first of all. Okay, so this is our picture of our SNM calculation. Um, and what we can notice here, an interesting thing, I mean, you could, would probably get to it if you think about it for a few seconds. What exactly is the size of the largest square? If we want to see the size of the squares, what we do is we take diagonals that are, you know, x equals y or q equals qb diagonals. And a square is actually uh, the area that fits into a diagonal. So each of these defines a square. Okay, so the largest diagonal that's going to hit both lobes, like for example here, is going to be the maximum size of the square. So if we can go and run all of these diagonals across the whole setup and see where they intersect with the two VTCs and find out what the biggest diagonal is that's in between, you know, two of these lobes, then that will give us the maximum size square. Okay, so we need to find the distance between the points where these intersect with the butterfly plot, and the largest one um, is, is our SNM. Actually, uh, don't forget, uh, this is the diagonal, and the SNM is defined as the side, so we have to multiply it by cosinus, uh, cosine 45 degrees, and then we'll get the SNM. That's really easy, isn't it? Um, I actually uh, give this to my students every year as a kind of a, a task, see who can run SPICE and get it to do it, and um, I'm happy to announce that uh, two years ago one of my students was able to actually run this whole thing in SPICE and do the calculation. But traditionally a lot of places what they do is they'll export this type of a thing to MATLAB or Python or something and look for the largest square, but that doesn't really work very well when you want to do it on a million samples. Okay, and even the thing that we were able to do within, you know, the virtuoso environment, it, uh, it's not really uh, something that's uh, scalable and it wasn't very nice, it was, but it was done. Okay, so that's not a real easy thing to do. Luckily, Sievent came up with a cool idea. We can just turn around the graph. Okay, so this is a plot from his paper in 1987 where he took the SNM, right, the butterfly curves, these were in this right quadrant, the top right quadrant, and he spun the, uh, the coordinates around. So he changed the coordinates, instead of using the XY coordinates, he uses U and V coordinates. And that's something that we can do with linear algebra. Um, we just have new axes, and now once uh, the uh, butterfly curve is here um, balanced above the, the, the V and U axis, what we can actually do is just subtract um, the top butterfly curve from the bottom butterfly curve, or the opposite, and what we'll get is the size of the diagonals of the curve. And so this is exactly um, the size of the largest square, and then we just have to look for the maximum of them. So that gives us the distances between the intersections with the Q equals Q bar par um, parallels, and now all we have to do is find the maximum of the subtraction, and don't forget to multiply this by, four, uh, by cosine 45. So, how do we do that? Well, luckily, uh, Sievink did the math for us, and he showed that the transformation is a very simple x equals 1 over square root 2u plus 1 over square root v, and y equals minus 1 over square root u plus 1 over square root 2 uh, v. That, uh, what, what it will do, it will turn our graph um, 45 degrees counterclockwise. Now, Okay, bear with me for a second. What we're going to do now is define some function as f1, and we're going to write y equals f1 of x. Okay, so now if we just uh, play around and we um, 
separately find you know u and v from these guys we can say v equals u plus um, square root 2 of y and then uh, put f1 of x in there so we already have a definition of x which is 1 over square root u plus 1 over square root uh, 2 v so we get u plus square root of f1 of x which is again that okay so that is an interesting type of a thing here and um, what we actually did is we turned some function which was f1 was the function we turned it 45 degrees counterclockwise and the cool thing is that um, just spice or uh, something like the uh, the analog design environment of of uh, cadence virtuoso allows us to easily do this we have to um, draw the following transformation circuit so our input variable is u over here that's our um, dc sweep type of a variable and what we get is that f1 needs to have x at uh, 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 goes x to y right and we said we have to put in x uh, the 1 over uh, square root 2 v1 and 1 over square root u we just do it by using um, voltage controlled voltage sources and that gives us some out and we get that the uh, output the v value the output um, parameter is square root of v out plus u if you play around with the equations on the previous um, slide you will easily get to this actually and you can build this type of a circuit with just standard components in spice so what exactly is f1 well uh, you can see it here f1 is the inverter right that that takes us from um from q to q bar for example okay is that correct no because it, in this old process that Sivink and lostro were using they basically um removed uh, all the other uh, the, the feedback inverter and the access transistors but you can really put anything where you have a transformation from an input to an output variable so that was the feed forward vtc from uh, q to q bar but what about the mirrored vtc well the mirrored vtc is the q bar to q so now what we need to do is mirror the um the vtc and then flip it 90 degrees uh, so what we need to do is mirror uh and transform to the uv system and luckily Sivink and lostro provide us the math for that too here we just write um, v equals minus u plus uh, square root of 2x and we write f uh, that x is f2 of y so we get minus u plus square root of f2 v over square root 2 minus u over square root 2 and we can also easily um, draw that transformation we just change so now we have f2 that's the feedback from like qb to q and um, we have the voltage controlled voltage sources that um, provide us with this functionality to have v which is now called v2 at the output so what do we need to do let's uh, take this weird explanation that i just gave and try to make it feasible um, this is actually really easy to do so we take our 60s cell sram cell we draw a schematic of it um, give it labels okay and we have uh, uh, pins for q and qb that go out of the cell so we can drive an input here um, and get an output there we can make them as in outs so it'll be easy um, with our bit lines and bit line bar we'll connect them to vdd or anything else it doesn't really matter they shouldn't affect us too much and with our word line we'll connect it to ground to disconnect the access transistors so this is going to be our f1 function okay now we um, create the, the those two transformations so the two circuits we saw on the previous slides they're going to be called transformation one and transformation two one is the feed forward trans transformation one is the feedback transformation so one is from f1 in to f1 out one is from f2 in to f2 out okay um, at the u input we are going to connect the dc sweep okay and we'll see what we're going to sweep from it's actually not from zero to vdd it's uh, the um, range has changed okay and at the output we're going to get v1 that's going to be um, the first uh, you know transform butterfly curve um, the other one's going to give us the second transform butterfly curve and then we can just uh, uh, then we can just um, uh, subtract between them the input of uh, our first transformation is going to be q1 and the output of our transformation is going to be qb1 for our feedback the input of f2 is going to be qb2 and the output is going to be q2 so we're going to need two, two um, bit cells one for the forward transformation one for the reverse transformation and just another point if you know how to do it you should correlate between the two cells in um, in your spice setup so if you if you run monte carlo and randomize the parameters you'll make sure that the two um, copies of the same cell get the same parameters
Now we're going to connect F1 to Q to QB and F2 to QB to Q. That's what we just said before. So this is basically our whole setup. As you can see here, we have the two transformations, two copies of the bit cells, which again, I said should be correlated if you know how to do that. And then we're going to run a DC sweep on U, but we're not going to run it from zero to VDD, but because we actually spun ourselves around the, um, the coordinates on the uh, U, um, Axis are now going to be from minus VDD over uh, square root 2 to VDD over square root 2, which is where, um, where our uh, two butterfly graphs reside. Okay, and we're going to get the output of, uh, of those graphs, and so um, we can uh, just now subtract the two of them. So we subtract the bottom graph from the top graph. We find the local maxima from each load. We, load, we should actually put it in an absolute value. Okay, and the smaller of the local maxima is the diagonal of the largest square. This, of course, we have to multiply by cosine 45 degrees, and we get the SNM. So the final calculation is that SNM equals 1 over square root 2 times the minimum of the maximum of the absolute value of V1 minus V2 in the range U from minus uh, from uh, square root 2 to 0, and the maximum of V1 minus V2 when U goes from 0 to to square root 2, that's for the left side and the right side of basically our separatrix of our zero value. That's assuming it passes at zero, which it usually does somewhere over there, but um, that'll be fine. How about read and write SNM? So that was for static SNM, and it's actually really, really simple. We just use the exact same setup. But now, instead of having a bit line and bit line bar at any old value, we should connect them to VDD, which is the setup for read SNM. And the word line, we're going to now connect to VDD, and we'll run the same calculation. For the right SNM, same thing, but the difference is that we're going to connect one of the bit lines to ground. Um, again, you're going to have a difference between right SNM from one side and the other side, but since it's a symmetric cell, you can really do it just on one side. Uh, it's a bit trickier for right SNM because you'll have to play around with the calculation, because remember, the only place where we care about having a, a, a bi-stability is on the side that we're not writing to, so it's a bit um, harder to simulate, and as I said before, there are other options for right margin calculation, not just the static um, right SNM. So let's look here. This is the read test bench. Again, we have the same exact setup for the transformations. And the only difference is with the bit cells, now we have all of the bit line, bit line bar, and word line all connected to VDD uh, uh, for both of the feed forward and feedback cells. Um, this, uh, and then for the right test bench, again, same thing. We have the, uh, uh, the same thing, except for here we put on the bit line and bit line bar, ground and VDD. Um, for for these guys, um, so that is uh, basically our uh, uh, the way that we do this uh, uh, this uh, thing, and it's really nice to see because now we just run a simple DC sweep. Okay, these two, all these four, um, all these four blocks are in the same test bench. So one DC sweep will actually give us the read SNM or write SNM or hold SNM immediately. And therefore we can run Monte Carlo simulations with process variations and so forth. And we can get a nice histogram of how our SNM is distributed uh, uh, over, um, you know, uh, is distributed over many samples. So what exactly happens with SRAM stability under process variations? The nice thing about SRAM is, as we saw, um, we have these VTCs that give us these butterfly curves, and they're really wide. So the noise margin is big, okay? And uh, what is big? That's a good question. Um, so, uh, you know, big means that we never fail. Uh, but it, it actually, and the question is, what is the noise source that actually makes, you know, if this is a 300 millivolt, you know, static noise margin, is that enough or not enough? And it's a good question. And I don't think there's a specific answer, especially because, as I mentioned before, um, the noise is not a static phenomenon. And there is no such thing as a noise, as a, a, a static voltage uh, noise source of 300 millivolts. But it might be something that methodologically, when you're designing your SRAM, you give a certain number that that's what is enough. Um, there is a very important point that comes out, though, when you actually do, uh, um, when you actually uh, uh, um, do manufacturing. And that the fact is that when we take our VTC and we look at it under static noise margin, um, 
uh, when we look at it under variation, what we're going to have is not exactly this. We're going to have a, a lot of noise around that. So uh, let's say we're going to get lots of these VTCs that are going to go around here and lots of VTCs that are going to go around here. And we're going to have a ton of these things that we're going to actually get this like big area here of VTCs and a big area here of VTCs and our uh, in the end we have to measure like the smallest type of a lobe here and it's going to be much smaller as you can see than the uh, VTC under nominal conditions and we never want it to go under a certain value but what is that value well this is a, an interesting um, thing here that, that, that you can see what we get actually is again usually some sort of a Gaussian you know some sort of normal distribution where um, this is going to be uh, the static noise margin, and again, this can be also read or write static noise margin, um, and this is the frequency, right? The frequency of operation that happens, and we get here some sort of a mu, and we get here some sort of a sigma for this thing, okay? Um, so remember, we're going to have millions and millions and millions of these SRAM cells deployed, and we want all of them to work. The fact is that if there is something that reaches zero, where we have zero static noise margin, that cell... That one outlier is not going to work. It's going to be a broken cell. Now, what is the, the, the probability that it can happen? There is a probability. It is non-zero. So usually what we're going to have is we're going to, we're going to require that we have at least something like six sigma distance between our mean and zero. Okay? And that's under read margin, write margin, and static noise margin. Um, some people will actually require even eight sigma of distance there. One of the things that will happen actually is if we um, lower the voltage, these uh, VTCs will, will continue to be, but the, the, the margin gets a lot worse and uh, variation causes it to deplete a lot more. And then our uh, Gaussian will be much more you know, wider, our sigma will grow and our mu will uh, be lower. And uh, then we're going to be harder to make this six sigma or eight sigma variation. So SRAM becomes very unstable under uh, process variation and, uh, and especially under voltage scaling and it can be checked using our static noise margin uh, um, uh, per, uh, metric and I just want to mention again that one of the things that's important to, uh, to say here as I mentioned before um, dynamic noise margin is a much more real statistic or me real metric than static noise margin but static noise margin actually tests the manufacturability of the SRAM so if you have a negative or a very small static noise margin it means that actually the manufactured cell um, those outlying cells will not work um, it doesn't have anything to do with their dynamic uh, uh, how much noise margin they actually have it just means that they don't work at all they're not stable they're not bistable so that's why we require the six sigma or eight sigma um, of, uh, uh, of static noise margin just for the fact that we can actually robustly with high yield manufacture these cells now, um, another important point here that's kind of uh, disconnected from what we discussed, but is really important because nothing will work if you try to go and simulate it in the lab, has to do with metastability convergence in, in Spectre, um, which is the uh, cadence simulator, uh, the cadence spice simulator. And it, it's also true in spice. So um, there's something that uh, is called a node set. And the, the question is, what solution does virtu uh, Virtuoso find with the standard uh, operating point? Okay, or just spice. So... Um, Again, we took our uh, our um, SRAM cell, right? And we had uh, these guys were connected to ground, so they really were kind of disconnected from the thing. And we run a simulation. What are we going to get for VQ and VQB? Well, the answer is we'll probably get something like um, Q equals VDD over 2 and QB equals VDD over 2. And the question is why? Because that is actually, when we look at it, um, we have our, you know, our butterfly curve. Out of all of the possible uh, solutions, it is returning us with this solution, which is our metastable point, which is actually an almost non-physical point, right? It's something that it, it's metastable. It's not really a stable point, but that's what it's giving us. Well, DC sweeps, they actually start with a guess that all the nodes are at zero. And zero is usually going to be on our separatrix. And what I said and told you before, that if we're on our separatrix, we're going to converge to our metastable point. So um, what's going to happen is that the way that SPICE works, it in increments and it has this convergence type of a operation. And it's going to guess that Q and QB are at zero. And because of its initial guess, it's going to actually converge on this metastable point. That's a real bad situation. 
Okay, and we can fix this because that's not a real situation easily by giving what we call a node set option. So um, there is something called convergence aids in, uh, in, in, in Virtuoso or in Spice altogether, and one of them is the node set. And the node set means, listen, when you take your initial guess on a DC operating point, don't guess that all the nodes are at zero. Just guess, for example, that Q equals, uh, I don't know, um, something over here, 800 millivolts. Just say um, Q equals 800 millivolts, and I bet you that we will uh, get the answer that stabilizes over here. It would be better to give something that's actually Q and Q B equal, uh, say Q equals VDD, and Q B equals v ground uh, equals G and D, and then um, we're going to really get a, uh, a, a uh, we're going to be sure that we're not somewhere on the separatrix, even though probably anything that is not 0, 0, or VDD over 2, VDD over 2, or Q equals QB will probably get you to one of the real points. Otherwise, you're going to always hit this uh, metastable point, and you're going to get really bad um, uh, results and say that what I taught you in this course doesn't actually work. So, um, just to, to summarize kind of that, we have something called node sets, and we also have something called initial condition. These are, uh, in general, called conversion aids, okay? And we said node sets, what they are, they, they're this um, a, a kind of a manual way of telling Spice, take your initial guess over here. This is used for DC conversion. It's not part of transient analysis. This is not to saying that the actual voltage was VDD and ground or some other type of a, a, of a voltage here. It was never that. It just gives it an, a way to initially guess some sort of solution. Um, by the way, um, at the end of each simulation inspector, it's going to save the uh, the DC operating point, and you can load it as a, as a node set for your next simulation. It doesn't mean that you're going to converge to the same exact place, especially if you made some sort of change in your simulation, but uh, it, it will give a better guess, and then convergence will happen faster, or your simulation, in other words, your simulation will run faster. So um, that's what node sets are, and they're, they're essential for places where you have metastable conditions to stay away from them, but they'll also help you converge faster and better for any type of DC operating point that you need to do. But pay attention, they are disregarded for transient analysis. In transient analysis, node sets are not taken into account. The other convergence aid which you probably run into is called initial conditions. And that is used actually for transient analysis and they're disregarded for DC convergence. Um, so an initial condition is telling a capacitor or a uh, uh, what its initial voltage is, or an inductor what its initial um, uh, um, current going through it is. So um, every capacitor has the option to add a, a, uh, a, a uh, initial condition, an initial voltage to it. A, uh, a, um, a, an inductor has the option to add an initial current through it, and you can also just put an initial condition on a node um, in the design. So um, this is going to enforce that voltage, and it really is the voltage of the uh, uh, of the capacitor at. Um, t equals zero at the beginning of the simulation. So it's it's but after the t equals zero, it will then change according to the the conditions that are inside the uh, the the circuit. Okay, so initial conditions are how to give a starting condition to your circuit under transient analysis, but they're again disregarded for DC convergence. Just if we're already talking about simulation, a few more tips for um, working with Virtuoso or with some other um, simulation and schematic suite. You should really work with design uh, hierarchy. You uh, can create these transformation functions that we showed you before and the device under test, you know, the F1 and F2. You can, uh, you can make them symbols and then you can reuse them. You can store them in some sort of folder and reuse them with any SRAM type of a cell that you're going to uh, eventually design. Okay, you can uh, create multiple tests in one uh, ADXL view if you're using uh, the Virtuoso suite, and that can really help you do a lot of things at the same time. You can do the read, the write, um, and the hold SNM in just one setup. Okay, you can use variables and parameters to define initial conditions and node sets. You don't have to actually go into each one of your instances and set the um, node sets that are on the capacitors. You can uh, use a parameter over there and set the parameter as part of your test, and that really helps you um, simulate things in a much more efficient way. 
Um, you should probably create supply voltages in a separate symbol. You'll see that when you're doing a lot of these simulations, you're going to be over and over again drawing your supply voltages with VDD and ground and so forth. Well, why don't you just make a box that has VDD and ground defined in them with even a global VDD and ground parameter, and then you can just uh, instantiate that box and you'll have everything predefined. And another thing is, and this we said before, always use buffers to smooth transition and reduce uh, cross, uh, cross cap in your transient simulations. So that was the end of our discussion on the SRAM bit cell. Um, there are a, a whole bunch of uh, references over here. And um, uh, in the next lesson, we'll go on to discuss the peripherals of the SRAM cells.